frontier models. Should we control them? To discuss today, I have on Anton Koronek and Marcus Anderling, two of the 24 co-authors of a recent paper, Frontier AI Regulation, Managing Emerging Risks to Public Safety. Marcus is the head of policy at the Center of Governance for AI, as well as a CNAS fellow, and Anton is a professor at UVA. Welcome to China Talk, you two. What is the thesis of this paper? Uh, frontier AI models, so these are models that, um, the way that we define them are sort of future highly capable foundation models. So models can do a broad range of tasks. Um, in the future, we think that some of these models might have uh, really quite dangerous capabilities. Uh, so they might be able to sort of be really quite helpful in conducting cyber attacks. They might be really quite helpful in helping someone um, do a bio attack um, and, and these kinds of things. And, and then our, our sort of main claim is that um, these kinds of dangerous capabilities um, suggest that these models might need some kind of regulation. Uh, they might need to have sort of government be able to step in and be able to um, look at what kinds of models are are being deployed before they are deployed and help uh, sort of inform inform decisions about what kinds of models should be sort of put out there into the wild. A frontier AI model. Uh, how would you like to define them and why uh, are they scary? Uh, we call sort of frontier models, models that could have um, cap dangerous capabilities that would be sufficient to sort of be able to cause some kind of severe harm to public safety, to national security. Um, and then and then the big question is, okay, well, what what models have those kinds of properties? What models might have those kinds of dangerous capabilities? Figuring that out is, is really quite difficult. Um, I think the best we can do at the moment um, is to say, well, they are models that are using, that are trained using a lot more compute um, than, than models that, that exist today. Some of those might be, be really quite, uh, quite dangerous. Uh, there are enough that sort of some regulatory intervention might be warranted. There needs to be uh, a lot more of this kind of this kind of red teaming, this kind of poking at these models and actually seeing what they are capable of. Uh, the thing that you want to happen is that you want to sort of simulate what would a really, really bad person or a bad actor um, do if they had full access to this model. Say someone is trying to figure out how to get access to a bioweapon. Um, they can use Google uh, and they can use uh, these models. To what extent does using the model actually help them? Um, and, and we're starting to, people are starting to run, run these kinds of tests. And I think um, my guess is that currently they are actually more helpful than, than Google. I would expect that I would have a, I would have a significantly easier time if I, uh, if I had access to these models because they can sort of, they can, you know, I can, I can ask them questions and they can, you know, they can tell me if I'm going wrong somewhere. Uh, and so I think in the future, I don't know how close we are. Um, it'll be closer to sort of the experience of either having access to Google or talking to a really smart PhD student. Um, and presumably, I would I would take the latter. And when OpenAI first uh, had finished training GPT-4, they did honestly a pretty responsible thing. They locked it away for eight months. We don't know what the next generation is capable of. The thing about intelligence is, and, you know, I can attest to that uh, being a researcher at the university where I regularly see that somebody is just a tiny little bit smarter than I, they can suddenly write this much more fantastic paper than I. Relatively small increases in intelligence can suddenly generate uh, really huge uh, advances in capabilities. The analogy that comes to mind is video games. So before video games are tested, like you hire lots of like people from all over the world to like run into every wall and you know figure out where you know what quests are broken and what things aren't working and like inevitably as soon as any game gets released to the you know tens hundreds or millions of of users out there like people find totally completely game breaking things uh, for the first three days it's fun and then like by day four or five um there are already hacks and everyone is shooting you through a wall and it's just like becomes like a not enjoyable experience um, until maybe like two or three months later when the, 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 the developers end up fixing all the code. So, I mean, I'm like a little skeptical of even what a 500 or 5,000 person like red team effort could end up um, doing um, if you have such a enormously wide attack surface in like, you know, all of human knowledge um, sort of that you can like prompt in any in any way imaginable um, to potentially get you to do new things. To what extent will it even be possible to sort of use, um, you know, today's tools and approaches to make sure that 
uh, uh, models uh, that are, you know, uh, potentially radically more powerful than ones that we have today are, um, uh, you know, on balance good. Getting to the point where you can make sure uh, that a model cannot engage in certain kinds of behavior, it, that just seems incredibly difficult. Um, the thing that we can do is we can be, you know, more confident uh, in in what what behaviors um, exist in the model uh, and and the extent to which those those behaviors can be elicited by uh, by users. Uh, so, I, so in my mind, there's there's, a, there's two problems here. One problem is what could the model actually do, sort of absent any safeguards. Um, and then the second question is, okay, well, could you put in place safeguards such that it doesn't engage in that kind of bad behavior, uh, such that you know if if Marcus starts asking about all all types of bioweapons, then the model, you know, says, "Oh, sorry, I'm I'm but an AI model. Uh, I cannot tell you about how to build a bioweapon." Um, and so, so my guess is, like, all of this effort on on red teaming and and whatnot, what it does is it sort of it moves, um, it makes it more likely that we learn about worrying things before the model is widely available. It's out there; more people have access to it uh, than after the fact. When um, maybe maybe even in in the future, we might we might learn about uh, worrying things a model can do. Um, after it's it's actually even caused harm. So there might be systems that could have you know certain kinds of capabilities where it's not obvious that they should be made widely available. I think that the disagreement oftentimes will just come down to okay, well, what point is it the case that um, a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of model um, shouldn't uh, obviously be uh, obviously be open sourced, and at what point should uh, sort of uh, governments put in place processes to be able to put an in, like have an input into that decision. My guess is that, you know, at some point we will need um, government or, or society at large to, to be sort of be able to partake in these decisions as well. Yeah. This document, we're talking about something that is, you know, still a few years away and the sort of risks that we're, that we're focusing on are not the sort of more conventional, like concerns people have about technology of how, you know, Facebook makes you sad or um, Amazon's taking away jobs and small businesses or whatever. It's still like, a few years out in a way that um, I think gives researchers like uh, more, um, you know, mind share of the discussion. But um, I guess for you two, I'd, I'd be interesting to sort of hear your reflections about this discussion and how this debate has um, evolved or changes as you have more sort of like corporate behemoths and um, uh, government players starting to um, uh, uh, have uh, strongly held views about how these sorts of uh, devel developments should potentially play out. Power will will move away from um, from sort of the people who are sort of yeah the sort of the research engineers uh, and the research scientists at these kinds of companies, and um, you'll see profit motives um, mattering a lot more and, and corporate interests mattering a lot more at some point. Uh, and and we're starting to see inklings of this now. Um, you will have um, sort of governments. Uh, both needing to to step in and and sort of starting to to think about how to do so. You can't rely on on the goodwill of uh, of any corporation or or any developer of these um, these systems. We need to find a way for um, sort of governments for for society at large to be able to sort of hold them accountable and and not have a system that sort of relies on relies on trust in any any particular uh, actor. My other takeaway reading this paper was like. I mean, I came away like a little hopeless um, just because of there, <laughs> oh, just no. because there were so many sort of like open questions. And I think and I think there and I think it's like a relatively narrow um, technological future in which this sort of things ends up being relevant. And you guys speak to this of like, you know, you need training runs to be incredibly expensive. You need um, them to require the types of chips um, uh, and like, you know, even going beyond what's sort of um, uh, uh, being restricted into China. Care to sort of like meditate on like in which futures this is, um, you know, even if you have this sort of like political will, like in which technological futures, this type of vision would not end up um, being all that useful. Maybe open sourcing continues to sort of keep pace um, or sort of manages to keep pace with, with the frontier uh, and with the sort of proprietary models. Uh, or maybe the proprietary models, you know, they, they get leaked, they get stolen um, and, and all these kinds of things. Um, in that kind of world, um, then I think what we'll, what we'll need to do, and I think this is the thing that we need to do, do regardless, is sort of um, it's not going to. It's not going to be sufficient to just focus on the sort of development and the deployment process. Algorithmic efficiency will keep going up. Uh, sort of access to chips will keep going up, and 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 you know over time these models will just will just proliferate. Um, if you put in place this kind of regulation, you'll have this time window where you can know, okay, well, 
we will have these capabilities. They will be broadly distributed at some point. Currently, they're a little bit more under wraps than, than they will be in the future. We can put safeguards in place, et cetera. Um, but you need to use that time. And, and the way that you need to use that time, I think, will be, you know, you, you need to prepare for, for a world where, uh, where things are more broadly distributed. So you'll, you'll need to figure out, OK, well, what do we do in a world where, you know, a, anyone can um, sort of ha produce super high quality disinformation or um, can, you know, um, engage in, in, in certain kinds of cyber attacks, et cetera. So, so that just means we'll need to build up our defenses. Basically. It seems to me, Marcus, that like the only hope is that like the the AI defense is better than the AI offense and the the world in which these models are like in, insanely powerful. My guess is that you will always have some kind of distance between um, sort of certain kinds of proprietary models and the ones that are sort of very, very widely distributed, right? And then you want to use that distance in a good way. One of the main ways that you're going to use it, I, I'm imagining, is, is these models that are sort of are more quote unquote locked down. Um, those models you um, you can use more for for defense. In my ideal world, you have something that looks, and I think we can we can end up in this world. Um, you have something that looks like sort of responsible disclosure for cyber vulnerability detection tools, and that means you know those tools are first made available to the actors that will find and patch vulnerabilities rather than uh, then sort of uh, exploit them and, and sort of undermine national security in all kinds of ways. Marcus and Anton, thanks so much for being a part of this. Thanks so much.